And I really appreciate everybody else uh, coming on and, and talking about this because it, it, it couldn't, on a week that Carl uh, Nassim came out in the NFL, it could be not be more important to talk about this. Uh, it is Pride Month and it is uh, incredibly important for people, whatever your background, to figure out your way in this world. And we hope that we can help a little bit. I want to introduce our panelists one at a time and then they can sort of self introduce themselves. Rick Gomez is the vice president for human resources at AT&T. Rick, tell us a bit about yourself. Well, all right. So Rick Gomez, I do support our AT&T business and corporate finance with our HR business partner team. I've actually been with the uh, company just over 24 years. And, you know, really a little bit about me, I actually have, you know, really, really love that we're having this conversation because I do think this intersectionality that impacts so many of us when you think about being, a, you know, a, a woman and also being a lesbian or you think about being, you know, Hispanic and also being a, a member of the LGBTQ plus community. There's our unique things that we experience and for me. I know we'll talk a little bit about our coming out journeys as we kind of dive in there, but this was a this was a, a real big journey, a tough journey for me. I grew up in a very conservative, very Catholic, very uh, Mexican, very machismo driven culture of a family. And for me, the idea of actually being a, a gay man was something that I knew was not going to be widely accepted by my family, you know, both my immediate family, my extended family. And so um, I actually didn't come out until my uh, almost 30 and I actually already been with my partner now husband uh, for six years. So my coming out stories about how I actually lived a dual person uh, personality dual person life for many, many years. And my coming out story was about deciding that it was too exhaustive for me to manage, you know, being two people. And that's when I became one where I actually felt like I embraced you know, uh, genuinely who I was and shared that with my family. When I did that with my family, I felt I could share that with my work colleagues. And um, so it's definitely been a journey, but I do think there's unique circumstances that we've all had to experience, um, you know, just with some of the uh, stereotypes and stigmas and the longstanding kind of uh, uh, cultural, you know, narratives that we all have, especially in the Hispanic Latino community, but also with, uh, you know, experiencing this intersectionality. So just a little bit about me. Uh, Rick, uh, thank you so much. It is, uh, it, it is incredible to think when you were in that one place before you could come out, just how terrifying it felt. I don't know that it feels as terrifying for younger people today to come out. Maybe mm -hmm. it is, maybe none of that has changed, but we'd like to maybe get into that. So we have Los Dos Ricks here today. Rick Wilson is the Vice President of HR for Destination Cleveland, one of my favorite cities. Uh, Rick Wilson, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Thank you, uh, Miguel, and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be part of this important conversation. Um, you may be wondering, well, for those of you that don't know me, how did uh, someone from Destination Cleveland and Cleveland, Ohio get to this call? So I'm a proud AT&T alumni, so I do wanna also acknowledge and thank Asemos and League for putting this together. Um, but just really quickly about me, um, I was with AT&T for 25 years, by the way, um, before I decided to, to make that leap and leave. But in terms of my own background, uh, I am from Northeast Ohio, born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I come, similar to Rick Gomez, come from a Mexican-American family. Both my mother and my grandparents, her whole family is from Mexico. So I am technically first generation. Uh, and, you know, my story, I will say, as a young person was more about feeling different because I was a Latino. And then as I grew into my kind of teen years, I began to feel differently, right? And that's where I kind of truly realized, like, I was gay, even though I didn't say that until, you know, many, many years later. And I'll share more of that as we get, like, deeper into the conversation. But I will tell you, it talking to young people today, Miguel, to your, to your comment earlier, it's still a challenge depending. I think there's more role models that people can look up to, but it's yeah. still challenging in, in individual ways. Um, so I am like an out pr gout, proud gay man, uh, a Latino, and uh, I'm just really excited to be with all of you today. Cool, thank you very much for, uh, for being here with us. And, and those two little words, I'm gay, can be 
so ridiculously hard to say for so many people out there. So, and, but once you do, you, I, at least in my case, I felt really stupid for ever having thought any other way. So there was that side of it as well. Uh, Kathy Martinez, uh, last but certainly not least, our favorite uh, uh, store everywhere, Walmart. You are the director of labor relations for Walmart. Please tell us a bit about yourself. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks, Miguel. Um, so like Miguel said, my name is Kathy Martinez and my pronouns are she, her and ella or y ella, right, in Spanish. <laughs> uh, so I would need to throw that in there. Um, I identify as a lesbian. I always like to put that out there because sometimes, you know, there's a profile, I guess, that you have to, to fit, right? Um, happy Prime Month, everybody. Um, I'm, I'm like, like the rest of the panelists, I'm super excited to be here with all of you. Um, I'm the director of labor relations for Walmart, as Miguel said, but I really I wanted to mention that because I, I really enjoy the role that I have um, and the amazing opportunity to interact with so many of our associates. Um, and then even more proudly, um, I also am very fortunate to um, be the vice chair for our LGBTQ plus associate resource group at Walmart, which is called Pride. And I lead uh, the, the Walmart US segment, which touches uh, 1.3 million associates. And again, I say that proudly because um, what an amazing opportunity I have to, uh, to touch so many people, right? So, um, you know, it, it's helped me be more comfortable in my own skin. Um, and I'll share a little more, more about my story later, my coming out story later, I'm sure, but um, it really helped me coming to Walmart and, and having an opportunity to, to serve, right, in this, um, in this role, um, but also to amplify the voices of so many people, so many LGBTQ associates at Walmart. Um, it has really been amazing for me. Um, just a little bit of my background, I come from a little island um, called the Dominican Republic. Uh, <laughs> Um, and as you all can imagine, if you're familiar, very traditional values. I know that that both the, those those Rick said that they are uh, Mexican background. So I'm from the Caribbean, but you know it's a, it's a Latin a Spanish island, if you may, or or part of the island. Um, so I have a, I have probably a little bit of a different story to share, but very interesting and very relevant. And I hope that um, I'll have an opportunity to to help others or gives others some really great, you know, insight um, to help them move along in their journey of, of being authentic. Thank you very much. And I should just add for the record that I'm from New Mexico, very small town in New Mexico. So we kind of have different uh, representations from the Latino culture here, which is interesting because oftentimes you hear about the Latino cultures talked about as a, as a block, as a, as a, as a single entity, and it certainly is not. So we'll have a little of that perspective as well. Uh, Kathy, why don't we start with you? What what was your coming out like? And and was there any point in your professional career where being a Latina, being gay, being both, either hurt or helped you that, that you know for sure? And how did you sort of manage that? Yeah, so so um, like I said, I, I, um, I'm from the Dominican Republic, you know, lived there, was born and raised there. So, so uh, uh, you know, th there's different journeys for, for immigrants, right? Some of us are born here, but just from immigrant parents. I was actually born and raised um, in the Dominican Republic and migrated to New York City um, probably at 13. So, so later on, right, in my teenage years, um, and, and just fast forward, you know, was married, um, to a man, I should mention that, right? <laughs> in, the, wow. in the discussion, um, and had three amazing, um, uh, uh, daughters and then got divorced. Um, so one day <laughs> I met my, my now wife, right? And, and I'm going to tell you that, you know, I didn't plan it, right? I don't have this type of story where I, you know, some folks will say I knew since the moment I was born, which, you know, it's very respectable too, but. I, that was not my story, um, but, you know, fell in love with her for everything that she was and that she continues to be. And, and, and here I am. Right. Um, so after being in the for quite some time, you know, I, I had three daughters, like I mentioned, so I had to obviously go through that process with them and ensuring that they understood what was, you know, what was happening in my life. Right. Um, and then I decided after we were very comfortable as a family to, uh, to tell my mom, who was probably the most immediate family member that I had, right? Um, and as, as some of you can imagine, um, unfortunately, the reaction was not a good reaction. Uh, I have to say that things are good now. 
Um, but at the time, you know, the reaction was probably the reaction of, of many, you know, many moms, but many Latin moms, I would say. And, and, you know, she said things to me like, you know, why are you doing this to me? What, you know, what is, what is, uh, what is this grace to our family? Is this going to be right? And, you know, it, it really made you think in my time when I came out, I was already a mom. So I kind of put myself in that position. I was also, oh, how would I have responded to my children? if they came to me and told me this, right? And I always felt that I would have been supported, right? I would have been like, I, I love my children no matter what, right? So as you could imagine, it was a very disappointing um, and awful feeling um, to have your, your mom, who is typically your closest person, right? Um, not be accepting to you. Um, you know, I'll tell you that she did not speak to me probably for about a year um, and, and um, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that, um, you learn from that. I, I took I took that um, just maybe in my attempt to to protect my own emotions. I took that as let me give her some space, right? Let me give her an opportunity to just process all of this because I can't expect for everyone to just immediately be accepting, even though that's the way it should be. Um, and um, you know, I'll tell you, we're in a really good place now. Um, she uh, makes some insensitive comments sometimes, even today. Um, even homophobic at times, but I have learned to take that as an opportunity to educate my mom and to educate my family in general and say, hey, here's how this may be insensitive. And, and you know, when they're older, it's tough because I think that they're set in their ways, but, but she's trying and I appreciate that. She loves our family. You know, I always joke and I always say that when she first came to visit our family after, after I came out to her and we were on good terms, I don't know what she was expecting because she made comments like, oh, your family is normal. Oh, you guys are just like any other family. <laughs> but we were like, hey, what were you expecting? But it was definitely a good reaction. And then I'll tell you professionally, I, um, I, I, I will relate to you a little bit here, Miguel, because um, I finally decided to come out after joining Walmart, right? So I joined Walmart um, and I was in the closet when I joined Walmart uh, professionally. And I told myself that I was going to take some time to prove myself to all of my colleagues and my coworkers and things like that, because I felt that that was something that I had to do. And in reality, I didn't have to do it. Um, I set that barrier for myself. And if I have something that I could share with everybody, it's exactly that. I think that we think that sometimes we make ourselves different because we think that we have to prove ourselves to others and we don't. Did you have preconceptions about Walmart because it was based in the South, because it's Walmart? Did, did it make it more difficult to come out? And once you did, what, what did that feel like? Yeah, I think I, I think I didn't have so many misconceptions. And I probably had those more when I went to home office, which is in Arkansas and Bendo, Arkansas, because there it was really, really conservative. But I was hired in Miami, right, to work for Walmart in, in, in South Florida. But I think I confused the culture of Walmart for maybe a, a culture that may judge me, right? And it was absolutely the opposite, you know? They, they I think I, I, again, I think I set those barriers for myself rather than just allowing this, the process to work, right? Here's who I am, and I should have just been that from the beginning. Um, and then when I finally came out, I, I'll tell you, it was like, a, it was a, a renewed Kathy, right? because I was able to, to bring myself holistically to everything that I did in my job, right? To everything that I did professionally. And I think that that, that was a big takeaway for me is that sometimes we set these barriers for ourselves because we don't want to be rejected or we don't want to be dismissed. Right. But totally. we have to take the leap of faith, yeah. It's that fear of being excluded. Rick Gomez, you have a very powerful story about sort of where you're from and how difficult it was to wrestle with those two little words, I'm gay, and sort of you have, now you're at the, the top of the top, my friend. Um, so tell us a little bit about your story. Uh, thanks, Miguel. I mean, you know, so I, I, I think back, uh, especially when I start thinking about, you know, being really genuine around my story. And, you know, as many of us, when we kind of think about our childhood, there are things that really resonate and stick out. And for me, 
Um, I, you know, moved around every two years. My dad actually uh, was a warden in the federal prisons, and we moved around, you know, quite a bit growing up. But we always lived in areas where there was not other kids like me that were, you know, had brown skin. And so for me, the first time that I actually, you know, remember distinctly being different or being told that I was different was when we lived in Denver. And I you know, remember I was playing with some kids and one of the kids said, you know, we didn't want to play with you anymore. And I said, why? And they said, because you're Mexican. And I remember distinctly thinking, well, I don't even know what that means. Like I had not had <laughs> that told to me and I had to go home and literally tell my parents, like, well, why does this mean that I, because I am Mexican, what does this mean and why am I different? And so it actually then kind of created this armor that I felt like I had to uh, you know, overcome around being different because I had this, you know, distinction of being a brown skin, of being of Mex Mexican heritage. And so I grappled with that in terms of what it meant around, you know, cultural norms that were more prevalent, I felt like in the Hispanic or Mexican community. You know, I looked at, and I still do look at my dad as my hero role model, you know, that I aspire to, you know, just want to make proud. And he had the typical, you know, very macho, you know, upbringing, you know, he grew up in a very, very, uh, uh, you know, Hispanic family, but was, you know, the, the all-star football player, was in the military, you know, was a warden, so you can kind of, you know, see the trend there. And ultimately, I knew that for me, like, those weren't things that I could actually even get my head around. Like, I wasn't into sports. I couldn't talk sports to my dad. My dad had more in common with, you know, my sister to talk about some of those things or whatever. But, but I remember always things that would come up, you know, when I started to think about me and actually being, you know, maybe I was gay. Because, of course, when you're young and 13, you don't know what really gay means. But I knew that I was a little bit different. I remember things that happened, you know, so the first time that one of my family members came out was a cousin, and I remember my father, very similar to what Kathy was talking about, talking about what a disgrace it was and how disappointed my grandfather was going to be and how, you know, I started thinking about, like, my gosh, if, if my father feels that way, like, this is never going to be an accepting environment for me. So it was, again, like, carrying this armor of, like, feeling like I needed to you know, kind of not really truly be uh, embracing of that part of me. And um, so I actually lived this, what I truly feel is a double life, both outside of work and uh, inside of work. So I had my, you know, friends that knew that I was gay, and then I had my friends that I, you know, wasn't. And those worlds two never combined. You know, I did not want those, you know, others that didn't know to know. It's same thing at work. You know, I, for, for when I actually came out to my parents, my one of the things my dad told me is that to never tell anybody at work because you will never be successful at your at your job. Like there's going to be people that are going to judge you simply for that rather than your performance. So again, it kind of like made me feel like okay, I can't do that at work. You know, my you know my role model, my hero is sitting here telling me this. Um, but he also talked about how important it was like to never tell my grandfather that my grandfather you know, had an image of what his grandson should be and that it would kill my my grandfather for him to know that he had a great gay grandson. And so, um, you know, those are kind of the reasons why it took me so long to, you know, accept who I was and also become more comfortable. But uh, my husband now, who I actually met here at AT&T, been, we've been together 24 years, um, met him here and we, you know, um, had a relationship for six years and when I was turning 30 I said I'm not going to turn 30 because I'm not going to have this double life that I live it was truly exhaustive um, and you know there was things that always would come up at, at home like my parents even remember how distinctly they remodeled their house and they painted their hallway and put new pictures in the hallway and I remember there was an area in the hallway where they left blank and I said, well, what is this area? And they said, this is when you, you and your wife get married. You know, this is where we're gonna put you and your wife. And I'm thinking, oh. all right, well, are they gonna put me and my husband's picture in that corner, you know, or whatever, like, um, but but ultimately I finally said, okay, I'm not gonna turn 30 until, you know, tell my parents. So, you know, I, 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 you know, am so grateful that my husband stood by me because I did not actually even want him to have a relationship with my family or, you know, and we talk about how horrible I would have could possibly treated him back then because I did not want him to be around my family wanted to do it but I would tell him like okay I'm going to my parents and I'm going to tell them today you know and then I'd come home and be like I couldn't do it you know 
And then I, you know, next time I'd be like, you know, I'm going to go tell them. And then I'd come home and I couldn't do it, you know. And at that point, I really truly realized that I was willing to accept that my family was going to disown me and I would not have a relationship with my family. Um, but I felt like it was just too hard for me to continue to go on. And so what, what happened whenever I finally had this moment, we were watching a TV show. My dad said, hey, you know, I want to get my grandson a dog. And I was like, oh, you ought to get him a dog like our dog. And he said, that's a, in a, in a derogatory way, an F kind of dog, like very feminine, whatever kind of dog. Won't repeat the word. And it hit me and I immediately started crying and I felt like, okay, this is going to be the moment. And after crying for three hours <laughs> and then my parents going, what is wrong with you? You know, I finally used those words, Miguel, about I am gay, and I was waiting for the reaction of like, you know, kind of Kathy, what you talked about and what was going to happen. Um, and, you know, I get emotional to this day thinking about how counter it was, um, how my dad, you know, said, you know, you're my son and I love you no matter what. And uh, I was not expecting that. I felt like it was so hard for me to get to that point. And I built up this uh, experience that I was going to have for it to be very different. Now, has it always been, you know, rainbows and butterflies and unicorns along the way? No, <laughs> it's been it's been a journey. But I also felt like, you know, when we're talking about this intersectionality, I felt like there was this added pressure that I wasn't Mexican enough. Um, and, you know, even when I was telling you all about, like, living in Colorado, where I was predominantly the only, you know, person of brown skin, then I moved when I was in high school to an area where I was, you know, in, not in the minority. It was predominantly Mexican. And I was always being told that I was a coconut, that actually, if y'all have ever heard that, about being brown on the outside and white on the inside, that I acted too white, <laughs> that I dressed too white. And so, you know, for me, it, it was always around like this energy of like having to be more, try to act more Mexican, whatever that felt like, and then act less gay. Um, and so, you know, like I said, it's been a journey and, and uh, definitely I feel very blessed that my family has accepted my husband and I, and we are in a great place with both of our families. Um, but, but definitely, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a tough journey to get here, so. Rick, you are making us all emotional. You're, this yeah. is too much. Uh, well, well, first, the first question is, is, uh, is the picture of you and your husband now in that spot in your parents' home? Uh, yes, there is a picture there. Ah. And, uh, and uh, the other thing that I will say that, um, you know, really kind of changed things for my dad that, um, so many, many years ago, um, we had a horrible, like, six weeks where, um, Trey, my husband's uh, aunt, was killed in a car accident, and then two weeks later, my aunt passed away unexpectedly, and then a month after that, his grandfather passed away, and then I, you know, a couple of weeks after that, I had an aunt passed away. So there was all this trauma and death in our family, but what my dad realized is that he said, you know, son, he says, I've always, you know, you know, been happy for that you found somebody, but what I didn't realize is that you're just like your mother and I, like Trey is your mother to you, you know, and you're a family. And I saw how he was there for our family when we needed him to be for our family, when we were dealing with this, you know, trauma, and you were there for his family. And ever since then, he became mijo. And for me, you know, if you understand, mijo is a very term of endearing for, you know, my son. And so Trey is a mijo. Now, Trey didn't know what the heck mijo meant because he's a Caucasian. <laughs> um, but that just, you know, that moment really kind of shifted things for he truly did kind of feel like he was, you know, part of our family and, and felt, you know, very enduring to him. So, um, yeah, definitely very, very, very happy about, you know, my family at this point. And, and you talked about your fear of being found out or, or admitting that you were gay as, or, and, and Mexican as, as an armor professionally. Did, in in coming out is that a stronger armor did you drop the armor what i mean it it seems to me that the honesty is perhaps the strongest armor of all but i i don't i wonder how you think about it now yeah and miguel and you know my good friend rick knows my journey at work and has helped me along the way and i owe him a lot in terms of uh you know lots of uh, really really in-depth conversations but um but for me i pride myself in being a person of high integrity and character and for the many years here at this company where I lived this double life, I actually made up this 
other person. And for me, I struggled with I wasn't being honest with people. You know, I really would make up like, you know, this girlfriend that was named Chris that, you know, was my girlfriend when really, the you know, Chris was not my girlfriend, you know, but like, and I would make up excuses for what I was doing on the weekends or what I was, you know, how I was spending my time. And, you know, once I finally determined that that was not something I could continue and I truly became more authentic and genuinely with my relationship at work and people understood about me and Trey and my family, I actually do feel that it enabled my performance because I felt like I could actually be more genuine and I could have more authentic relationships with people at work where I wasn't guarded and I wasn't kind of being more, you know, um, you know, I don't know, reserved about, you know, letting people in. Um, so I do think it, you know, from a career perspective, um, you know, I definitely felt like once I was, you know, not having to live that other life and I could just truly let people, you know, know the whole Rick Gomez. Um, I do think that's kind of when I, you know, felt like I was, you know, able to, you know, get my full stride, if you will, at work. So interesting. Very interesting. All right, Rick Wilson, you that's you have a tough job, my friend, uh, following that. Uh, <laughs> Tell us about sort of where you are now and and your coming out and, and what it did for you sort of in your life generally and professionally. Sure, sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll keep my story maybe a little bit shorter just to make sure that we've got time at the end for some Q&A. But, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in a very, very strict Catholic Mexican household. So as I mentioned, my mom's from Mexico, but my dad was white, but my parents divorced when I was three. And so grew up in a very, very Mexican Latin culture and um, very Catholic as well, similar to Gomez. Um, and when my parents split, my abuelita helped raise us too. So grew up with Spanish, um, very Catholic. And growing up, my, my grandma always used to ask me like, are you going to be a priest? Like that was her, that was her wish, you know, to have her grandson be a priest. But I knew that that wasn't my calling and you know, I would also say for my family, we kind of had a, have a culture, a family culture of not always talking about how we're feeling. We don't talk about certain things, right? And so for me, I never was comfortable talking about how I was feeling different with my family. Even though I'm incredibly close to my mom and I have two older sisters, I, I never felt comfortable or in that safe space because I didn't want to be something that they would be ashamed of. Um, very similar to some of those issues that we've heard other people struggle with as they were trying to come out. So I just kept it to myself. And my way of dealing with that was I turned to food. That was my comfort. <laughs> so I became the, the slightly overweight, moderately overweight high school kid that was eating his feelings, um, which, you know, just brought on a whole nother layer of just kind of trying to fit in, you know, being an, an overweight kid in high school. But it wasn't until I got to college where I started to finally feel more comfortable in my skin. And, and I just can't, I just want to give so much credit to people that are role models. So, you know, thank you to, again, for, for all of you put this call together, because I think sharing people's stories and hearing people who've lived these experiences is so important. But I had a, a college professor who was the very first gay person that I actually looked up to. Because in my world, everyone that I looked like, if I turned on the TV, I saw Jack Tripper on Three's Company, like stereotypes of what gay people should be. I saw Liberace and Walter Mercado and just people that, that didn't look or act like I did. And so my college professor really inspired me. And, and I will tell you, he was probably by most people's standards, the most average person. Like his favorite drink of choice was a Bud Light. Like he was just your average, uh, you know, run of the mill gay guy. Um, very similar to, to the way Kathy was talking about, like her mom's reaction, like your family's very normal. Well, that's, that's how LGBTQ people are in most cases. We're just, we're just living our lives. And it was in college that I got more comfortable and finally, you know, joined, um, we weren't allowed in my college to have an LGBTQ group, but rather we had an allies group. It was a Catholic university. And so we weren't allowed to talk, technically talk about being gay, but we could have the allies group to support it. But of course, most of us that were in it were LGBTQ or, or just like really, really strong allies. So I was out in college and as I transitioned out and I started working, I actually went back in the closet because I didn't know how the work world would perceive me. So I was living two lives, but my outside life was out. I was, you know, with my friends doing, doing what young LGBTQ people do on the weekends and in the evenings. But when I would show up to work, 
I was, was very, very much closeted because I didn't want to be ostracized or treated a certain way. Because again, there weren't any other LGBTQ people at work that I could either connect with or felt comfortable looking up to. So it took many, many years to actually get to where I am today. And for those of you, I, I see a lot of friends that are dialed into this. Um, you know, I'm just truly now just who I am, right? I, I, <laughs> I never formally came out at work. I just started to live my truth. And so if people knew me or worked with me, yes, I have a boyfriend or yes, I have a you know partner. That's how I would use the language. I stopped worrying about it. And I think part of it goes to the culture of the company that um, you work at. Right, so if you're comfortable, if you understand what the company values are, you start to understand that it's okay to be who you are. And if people treat you differently, there's channels to address that, right? So, so I, I think that's probably what got me most comfortable. And I give so much credit to AT&T for helping me feel so comfortable in my skin because it was truly part of my professional experience. I wouldn't be here today without it. Well, and after all of us, you know, at least my speaking for myself, gaining the COVID nineteen over the last year, you look great now. So clearly, uh, <laughs> your uh, your eating uh, to uh, your eating your feelings has has subsided <laughs> to some degree, at least, uh, which is good. Uh, and professionally, did um, I mean you didn't really come out at work, but d did it make you a stronger employee? Did it did it change the way you? you uh, interacted with with your colleagues did it change the way you made decisions i would say yes for in, in the just an important thing that i forgot to mention so when i started to get involved in some of the diversity and inclusion work the very first group that i joined was the latino or the the hispanic employee group because i was in the closet and it was there that i started to build connections and start networking professionally so i would say being more authentic yes it has it has helped me professionally from the perspective that i've been able to increase my network and just grow professionally without the connections that i've made both from the latino group and also from the from the lgbtq one like just the mentoring the relationships in the mentoring both ways right people that i've helped and vice versa rick mentioned like rick and i had so many conversations about him coming out at work and it was always i always used to joke and rick you're gonna get so mad when i say this but i'd be like rick everyone knows you're gay like, like <laughs> so you're living in this like this world but those are the kind of conversations in the friendships and so those relationships i would say though quite honestly is you start to work day in day out like relationships matter in business and so yes i would say it's helped me immensely right i think it's time for a rupaul moment i hadn't really thought about this but uh kathy what would you say to your younger self knowing what you know today Oh, wow. Um, you know, I, I would say, I, you know, I would say, because I, I know this has been the experience for everyone, but I think that when you're young, you're fearless, right? But then I think that we all, uh, when we experience fears, that kind of draws us back in. But I would say just, just put it all out there. You know what I mean? I think it's about authenticity at the end of the day. I think it's about just accept, you know, we have to accept ourselves for what we are. And I think it begins with us because we're looking for acceptance from others, but we're more than accepting ourselves, then that, that's where we're failing. I think I, that that's probably, I know it's not ultimately like and hugely profound, but I, I would say, and I, I teach my daughters this all the time is have a voice, you know, stand up for something. Like I did when I joined this, this resource group, like, like, like Rick said is, I went in there saying, okay, let me see what I could do for others, but it helped me tremendously to hear other people's stories, right? So it's just about finding that voice and how you you find a way to to use it and leverage it to, to be more authentic, is what I would say. Rick Gomez, what would you say to a 10-year-old Rick Gomez? So I know this is a campaign and an organization, and there's a lot around this, but it, but it gets better. Like, I think that's what I would tell myself because I, there were many times where, you know, I was struggling with trying to fit in and trying to act like somebody that I wasn't and, you know, feeling like, gosh, when is it ever going to end? And when am I ever going to feel better about, you know, being in, in the skin and being comfortable with who I am? So just that it gets better, you know, obviously, I think, uh, you know, as many have, have mentioned, you know, I think we, we put our own burden on ourselves because of the fact that we think that we're not going to be embraced or we're not going to be loved we're not going to find our person 
And I think ultimately, you know, just being able to have, as Rick mentioned, like these role models and other people that you can see. I grew up most of my time in West Texas, and there was not anyone that I knew that was gay. So I, I didn't even know who to aspire to look up that was successful or doing, you know, okay. So I think to just that, just that it does get better. And, and Rick Wilson, up. what don't would be, what, what would be your one piece of advice to ten-year-old Rick Wilson? Well, the first thing would be put the Doritos down. <laughs> Those are not going to help you. Um, but it, it truly is. It, it's love yourself. And the second part of that is you can also love God because I struggled with that a lot All right. and used to try to pray the gay away, as they say, many, many times on Sunday. And so you, you, you can have your faith and be LGBTQ and, and love yourself is really what, it's, what it starts with. All right, uh, Kristen, I think we have a couple of questions here. Yes. Yes, we do have a new panelist. Um, Maria Roman has been uh, invited by Bambi in her place because uh, Bambi was invited to the White House at the last minute. Um, so if, we'll, if we can introduce Maria um, uh, on her behalf. And uh, Maria, if you'll take a moment to say hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, it is an honor to, although last minute, to be here and join the conversation. Um, as they mentioned, Bambi is right now in a plane, so she asked me uh, to come and join the conversation. Uh, I am fortunate to be the Vice President and Chief Operations Officer for the Trans Latino Coalition. Uh, I am a 50 year old trans woman originally from Puerto Rico. Uh, and it's beautiful to hear your stories of resilience and, and the journey that it takes for us to really get to a place where we're comfortable with ourselves and, and and begin enjoying our lives living authentically, which I think is the key to really being happy. I think uh, we see that LGBT folks struggle with, with being able to, to uh, live authentically in places, spaces. And I think these kind of conversations really um, through our living authentically can help other folks also give themselves the permission to just be who they are. Um, so I'm excited to be here. Well, Maria, first off, Bambi's excuse, what a lame excuse <laughs> visiting the White House. Come on, it's gonna have to get better than that. Yeah. Uh, and and two, since and thank you very much for being here. I apologize that I didn't realize you had joined us um, as a as a stand-in. Uh, but since you are here, we'll put you on the spot. Um, the trans community, it has become so politicized lately. And all my trans friends, you know, when some years ago when uh, a certain individual was elected to the, to the White House, there was a great concern amongst my trans friends that the, that the, the gays would just leave them behind, basically, that the, the rest of the, the lesbian and gay community would leave the trans community behind. What is it like right now? What What is your sense? I mean, the, my my sense is, is that there's greater inclusion in the trans community, and there is this sort of sense of, of everyone coming along. But how tough was it to come out to yourself? How tough is it today? For you know, for younger people that you hear from, to be themselves. So I think um, you know we are on the ground, right? We I, I'm privileged to lead an organization that works specifically with trans people here in Los Angeles, one of the largest cities in the country. Um, and in essence, you know, there's this notion because there is more visibility, we see more trans people in the media, that things have gotten better. And, and although there is more visibility and in some aspects it has, I think on the ground, people are still dealing with the same challenges that I dealt with as a young person from lack of opportunities when it comes to employment, unacceptance from family members, um, and having to resort to um, underground economy to just survive. I think what is beautiful is that we are taking up space. You see trans people across uh, the country um, taking up space, creating services and organizations like ours. We're one of the leading trans-led organizations in the country. And it's really about creating equity for trans people. When it comes to uh, economic justice, you know, trans people are behind our um, gay and lesbian counterparts. Um, me, myself, um, you know, I. I've gone to Conference Springs to, to some of my friends who owns their second home in Palm Springs. We don't see that amongst many trans people of color. 
Um, so I think there's a notion that things are getting better and they are, but on the ground, people still need and are struggling for the basic things that many of us take for granted now. And that's why the work that our organization does is so critical. That's why it's so critical for Bambi to be at the White House, that we're beginning to be um, not only invited, we're taking space in where it's important for us, our voice to be included. So I, I want to recognize that. I appreciate that you know our voices are included in this panel because it's often it isn't. Um, you know, I'm 50 years old and I've, I've been homeless. I've gone through this horrible process in my life to be where I'm out today. And today I'm where I need to be, helping my community, adding my voice to the conversation and making sure that, that we're included when programming and, and resources are out there. Because it is about funding, it's about resources. And if you think about um, programs for trans people, most programs across the country have uh, been created because of HIV. There's not a lot mm -hmm. of social programming specifically for trans people. And we're trying to change that landscape. Um, Interesting. Yeah. We have some questions here. Um, uh, Maria, I'll give this first one to you. Uh, this is from Christopher Garza. He says, I'm a very tolerant and open-minded parent, uh, having lived in this country and abroad, but I'm trying to understand the subject of my child who claims she is, quote, pansexual, unquote. Um, uh, aside from not overreacting, how would you recommend talking to her about this subject? I think you have to listen to your children. I think we all know what we are, what we like, what we want to do with our lives. We just need people to, to give us the freedom to be whatever it is that we want to be and love us regardless of what they might not understand. Um, so maybe say nothing to them, but listen to them. Just listen. You know, I don't understand everything either, but it's about really being there and supporting people and letting them be whoever they want to be. Kathy, we have one from Jim Homan here uh, who says, uh, where on the spectrum between activist and nonchalant do you think we need to be in today's workplace? My instincts to not be, quote, too gay, unquote, always struck me as internal homophobia but can one overdo it? Any thoughts, Kathy? Well, I, I think that uh, we have to most importantly be ourselves. I think that when you think of, you know, you mentioned before or, or you dropped the, the term oversharing, right? I think that um, we, we have to be just like anybody else, right? I, I don't think that we should ever engage in conversations that are inappropriate, right? I think there is a, a sense in corporate America, right? Like I think of Walmart, for example, and I am very proud to work for Walmart, but I think that there's been a lot of change that has had to happen internally because of the heteronormative cultures that we are navigating through, right? Um, so, so I think that be yourself, be yourself, um, engage in, in, in appropriate conversations, but don't leave out, you know, the things about you that people need to know in order to embrace you. I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation. Just like, you know, I always remember someone who told me when you walk into a room and you're straight, you say, Hey, my name is Kathy and that's it. Right. Why should I walk into a room and say, Hey, I'm Kathy. I'm, I'm a lesbian. Right. Um, <laughs> I think that we need to just, as we reach for that equality, we need to behave equally. Right. And I think that that's, that's a, a, a good rule of thumb. Uh, Rick Gomez, here's one from Jose Cartagena Ortiz. Which identity have been more difficult for you to bring to your own authentic self, being LGBTQ plus or from the Latinx community? Definitely LGBT. And I think, uh, you know, I think that's been because I, I do think that in, in society, there are um, probably more challenges for people to understand our community. Um, you know, what I would say, you know, just to add what Kathy said on that last question, because I do think that, uh, you know, for me, like finding a community where I could find others like me was really, really important. When I struggled and at the point where I was, you know, struggling with does life get better and is it even worth it to continue, you know, that is when I actually found, my, you know, my, somebody that was gay, was in a relationship, and I was able to have these very in-depth conversations around similar experiences, but 
you know, today, you know, there's organizations like the Trevor Project and Tyler Clemente Foundation, and there's a lot of companies out or organizations out there where you can go educate yourself. You can go, you know, get downloads of, you know, uh, information. You can, can find your sense of community. And I think that, to me, really makes a big difference. So. Yeah, it's amazing how simple it is and yet how complicated it is. That that simple sense of being included, that fear of being excluded, uh, no matter no matter what age you are, no matter how much experience you have, those simple feelings from the playground still sort of control our lives to, to a large degree. Rick Wilson, somebody asked uh, uh, Jeffrey Bonds, who said Rick Wilson shared his story regarding an inability to find representation within within the LGBTQ community. Now that you're out, do you find people within the LGBTQ community questioning how you present? I guess I assume present yourself. That's for Rick Wilson. Yeah, um, I don't. I, I'd say generally no, but I also acknowledge um, over my over my adulthood and just you know coming out journey that. I guess I don't know how to say this, but like I can be straight passing, and I don't, I don't, and and I don't know how that um, lands on some people, <laughs> right? In terms of um, my behavior, I mean, I'm clearly wearing a pink shirt. Again, I don't want to like build into stereotypes, but I'm also very proud of who I am. And sometimes, um, kind of like the example that Kathy was, you walk in a room, you're a person first. Um, now, I will tell you. Uh, I think how people choose to express themselves is absolutely, um, they have to live and walk in their own truth. And so it's okay to be more expressive or to act in a certain way, I guess is, is probably the easiest way to describe that or, or say that. Um, but no, I, I, the short answer to that question is no, I really don't. Um, I, I have not had that kind of brought up as an issue. Uh, and Maria Christopher Garza is getting a two for here. Uh, he has a follow <laughs> uh, a different question. Uh, Maria, do you feel that trans people are in competition with other economically depressed individuals in this country? I wouldn't say that we're in competition. I would say that we are one of the most underserved communities in this country and around the world globally. Um, we don't have access, right? We even if I take us as an organization that is translate, you know, we don't have access to the mega donors that other LGBT organizations have access to. Um, so we are at a disadvantage when it comes to being able to really develop programming that addresses all the complexities that we need in order to, to really be able to move our community forward. I would say that we're so behind our counterparts when it comes to economical equity. Um, yeah, um, even with policy, we've seen the last four years that, you know, it seemed like it was a blatant attack on trans people right, across right. the country. So, you know, I don't have the luxury of not being trans, right? Like the truth is that the minute I walk out of my house, I'm waving a flag that whether I would like to put it down and just walk and just people just not question my whole identity, that would be wonderful, but I don't have an option to do that. That's what trans, a lot of trans people around this country have to deal with, that they can't leave their transness at home. It's something that, that it is. Um, and it's a challenge for us to be able to secure the basic things that we need. Maria, do you feel more accepted today than you did five or 10 years ago? It depends where I'm at, right? Like, I think that sometimes I forget I'm trans. Um, and I could be at an airport in Ohio and um, somebody will go out of their way to remind me that everything that I am is appalling to them. Uh, when I turn on the news, I think we as trans people are living in sort of this dramatic that we're fed all these things of how the system that we live in is trying to erase us and make it impossible for us to have just the basic things that everybody wants. We just want, you know, we don't want special treatment. I want to have access to the same thing that everybody else has. And that's in many places, depending where you live in the country, impossible. Um, thank you very much, Kathy. Um, what advice would you give to young people? I mean, it's a very, I, 
I'm from a small town in New Mexico. Uh, who is this? Jerrica Godwin talks about being biracial and brown in a predominantly Caucasian community in a very small town. I grew up in a small town in New Mexico where Latinos were the, you know, the the majority in the in the country. So I didn't really have a sense of otherness in some way, at least on on the Latino side. But I certainly did from the gay side because I just I didn't really recognize. I mean, I knew I was gay, but just didn't really recognize as gay. Uh, Kathy, what do you what would you say to, to young people who are starting out their careers, coming out, wrestling with all these questions? What what's your advice? So so the first thing that I'm gonna say is is that we all need to come out when we're ready. I think it's 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 an extreme personal journey, right? Um and I think that one thing that we need to remind ourselves is that if you're not living authentically because you're worried about uh, what others will say or what others will think about you, um, you, you could potentially be missing out on a pretty amazing opportunity to, to live your truth, right? I think that many organizations, and I, I will again use Walmart as an example, you know, people like us, we're pushing organizations to be inclusive, but mean it and do it, right? It's not just saying I'm inclusive. We are you know, I, I always remember people used to talk about diversity and inclusion, right? And I said, do people realize it's two separate things? You know, because diversity happens very organically in many organizations, because like Walmart, right? We hire people from the communities that we serve. They come to us to work there. But how do you ensure that you are being inclusive? And I think that a lot of organizations today are recognizing that to have good talent, they have to be inclusive in every way. So I think the, the younger versions of us need to understand that there is we kind of paved this wave, right? If you may, I know that's what I get involved in advocacy is because I wanna pave the wave for the younger us, right? To be able to be um, in a more accepting environment. I think from a cultural perspective, we still have a lot of ways to go, right? I think that I look, I think of my culture and, and how there's still a lot of stigma today, but let's continue to educate, right? Um, I think that we're learning a lot from young people. Let's listen to them and their needs. That way, when they're coming to this environment, to the work environment, there's better places for them, better workspaces for them to be part of. But don't be afraid. Live authentically and just know that the, that it is better. We're living this place better for you today than it was 10 years ago. Uh, Kristen, do we have time for one more? Yes, we do have time for two more questions. Two more questions. All right, great. This one's for yeah. uh, Mr. Gomez, for, for, for Rick Gomez, I think. AT&T is a company and EGs do a great job of supporting those are extracurricular groups, but uh, uh, promoting uh, diversity uh, and denied uh, diversity and inclusion. However, when you go down to the team slash individual level, you see much less importance placed on DNI. Any suggestions on how to spark conversations with teams and also improve diversity hiring? That one's for Rick Gomez. Yeah, well, I think having conversations and having conversations at work that may be uncomfortable, I think, is where, you know, you start to make inroads. I know for us as a company many, many years ago, our chairman actually kind of gave us the permission to have these conversations in the workplace that for many felt like it was taboo or you couldn't have these conversations and, you know, along the lines of really trying to understand what people's stories were. And I feel like for, for many, um, you know, it's an education issue. You know, one of my, uh, you know, favorite quotes is that when you know, when you know better, you'll do better. Um, ultimately, I feel through storytelling and education. I mean, how powerful the story that, you know, Maria, you were just talking about or how, you know, like I think for many in that community, there's just needs to be education, better education to understand, um, you know, some of the challenges that, and uh, dynamics uniquely that face our trans community. But I feel like in a workplace, you know, you see the messaging from the very top, but you don't really have, you know, that kind of always permeating it from, you know, all levels in the organizations. And I think it just takes people having these conversations, understanding, being more genuine with their people's story that you start to see, we actually are more in common than we are different. Um, but it just takes, you know, being intentional about, you know, having the conversations I think is important. Right, and uh, Rick Wilson, you get the last word here, I guess. Um, the LGBTQ plus community has come so far so fast. I mean, just thinking just, you know, 10, 20 years ago and just to see how how far it's come in corporate America and other places to see gay pride parades and see the number of corporate floats. And I know there's a lot of pushback to that as well. 
Um, what what is your sense? What I mean, you've 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 been you've done the AT and T thing. You're now I, I don't know if this is your own business or you're working for a, another company now. Where is there still room for growth in the lesbian, gay, trans, questioning plus community? Yeah, I think um, agree. Totally acknowledge that like there's been so much progress, um, but just from some of the stories that we've heard today, particularly from Maria representing the transgender community, or at least one lane of that. Um, think about you mentioned at the beginning, Miguel. We just had the very first NFL football player in the major league come out, right? For I think the NFL is over 100 years old, right? So. So I would say as much goodness and success and progress we've made, there is still a ton more that we need to work on collectively as a community. And I can't, I really want to hit home on the allies, right? So for everyone who's an ally, a parent who joined this call, kind of goes back in our communities, we can't do this without our allies. Like we are a small group <laughs> to begin with statistically. And so the importance of our allies is just so incredibly strong in moving this whole movement forward in addition to our own voices. Uh, Christian, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thank you, Miguel. And thank you everyone for such an amazing conversation. This has been a wonderful hour and, and I just wanna thank you all. I uh, thank everyone who joined us to, to listen in. Um, we had some wonderful questions. Uh, so thank you again, happy pride and enjoy the rest of your month. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye, everybody.